Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Issues in Environmental Science. It is the 29th of October. And let's see. No. Share my screen. I'm having a little difficulty, just a minute. Okay, so what we're gonna to do today is finish off a few slides that I had about fossil fuels. Specifically, I wanna talk a little bit more about the BP uh, oil spill, and then uh, just have a little, some overview of some fossil fuel information. And I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about fracking um, and uh, the uh, Keystone Pipeline, which are just a couple of the many, many issues uh, re regarding fossil fuel usage that arise in our consideration of environmental policy. And then I'm going to turn it over to Carrie O'Reilly, who will be giving us a presentation of her, uh, dis well, dis her dissertation work and her thesis work on a oil spill that's been going on in the Gulf of Mexico since uh, 2005, 2004. So let me go ahead and get started here. Um, before I do, any questions, uh, concerns about things? Uh, I guess we'll have the, the fossil fuel talk. We'll talk about um, uh, Carrie's presentation and then I'll uh, have a breakout session in the time that remains. And I'd like this, the uh, students to talk about um, your milestone three preparations because of course that's coming up. You need to have your um, start thinking about preparing the drafts of your PowerPoint presentation and your written report for this uh, big team project that you're working on all semester. So when we get back together, there'll be uh, also time for uh, team presentations. And Carrie, uh, over the next uh, week or so, Carrie and I will be setting up um, uh, conferences uh, so that students can, uh, the teams can confer with each of, uh, with Carrie or me talk about what you'll be doing, answer questions about how to make your presentation and your report uh, uh, as good as it can be. Okay, any questions? Professor McDonald? Yes. Just so you know, um, Canvas is having some issues right now. Like I just tried to log in and it won't let me log in. So okay. <laughs> there are probably some students that go through Canvas for the Zoom link. And that's probably why there's- a Yeah, I noticed that there's only 40, 50 of us <laughs> present. Yeah, like it won't even. I had an issue there. with that too. Twice. Yeah, well, they just started with this two factor identification thing. And that's why I was a little late logging on because I had to do these, the second factor and had to call me on the phone. And um, it, it took a little while. So that may be what's happening with Canvas. I'm not sure. Uh, in any event, um, well, we'll carry on. And uh, I'll, of course, be recording the. The, the lecture and people can attend the lecture um, by, you know, later on if they need to. Let's see, am I in fact recording? Yeah, it looks like I am. Okay, so um, we were talking about the offshore energy uh, industry or infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf um, of Mexico has produced uh, a very sizable fraction of the oil that we've consumed in the United States and around the world over the last uh, probably 60 or 70 years. And um, the, uh, this has been, this is a source of revenue. So the uh, lease fees and the, the uh, funds that in taxes that flow into the government from this uh, activity are, are now and have been for a long time, the second highest source of revenue for the federal government behind the, uh, uh, in the IRS. 
Um, and in the course of doing so, that's you know, it's developed about 4,000 individual platforms. Um, most of these platforms, the bulk are in the uh, relatively shallow water on the continental shelf. Um, but more recently, um, uh, energy and exploration has been expanding into deeper waters, as we, as we said on, on Tuesday. And with these deeper water um, exploration and production activities, the investment goes way, way up. It costs you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to discover um, and install and then operate these, uh, these very deep water platforms. But the funds that they can obtain from this are potentially very lucrative. However, um, sort of the break-even number for the price of oil is really sort of impacting that in a very serious way, um, both before the COVID crisis and certainly in the, in the present day when the price of oil has really um, taken a very steep hit. And so if you think about how much money has to be invested for different processes, installing an oil platform or um, building a pipeline, as we'll see, there's a break-even price. And a lot of the operations uh, that produce oil have a break-even price that's pretty high. So the break-even price to make money for, you know, from an offshore oil platform once it's installed is around $40 to $50 per barrel of oil. And um, right now, the price of crude, I haven't looked this morning, but the price of crude has been hovering around $40 a barrel. And it was down as low as $25 a barrel um, in, the, in the first part of the pandemic. So this is putting a you know, real economic uh, strain on the uh, uh, oil and gas industry. And all of the major oil companies, uh, Exxon, uh, Mobil, uh, Shell, uh, Total, BP, you know, these uh, multinationals, very, very wealthy companies have been, you know, laying off massive numbers of people. And, and uh, we actually, Carrie and I actually have a project that we're doing for ExxonMobil. And that project has been, uh, instead of it continuing, it's been canceled, or at least we're not going to get any more funding from them. Um, and uh, the, the personnel that we've been working with are very much concerned about uh, whether or not they'll have jobs in the future. So the oil company is, you know, the oil industry on a whole is sort of functioned in this sort of boom and bust uh, mode where it, you know, sometimes it's very lucrative and they're making huge amounts of money and everybody has a new pickup truck and then, you know, things change and, and suddenly it's, uh, it's economic hard times. And so that's been a characteristic of the, of the oil oil industry. Well, we talked about the Macondo well and the Deepwater Horizon, and I think I, I went through a lot of these details originally. Um, it, it's worth noting, you know, just how many corners were cut in this process and um, the way that, uh, that they decided to, you know, try this sort of risky, unproven mode of plugging up the, the well. So they drill this exploration well, um, they're way over budget, they have, uh, you know, a great many sort of setbacks. I think they're, when they're drilling, I guess I should explain that the, the sort of drill pipe, uh, what they do is they have these 20 foot sections of pipe and this pipe is typically uh, four inches in diameter. So it's these thick iron pipes and they're put together in sections. And so 20 feet at a time, they lower, they first of all, they, they get the drill bit to the, to the sea floor and then they start drilling down 20 feet at a time. And every 20 feet, they add a new section of pipe and down it goes. Um, and so when you see those um, um, you know, movies and pictures of people on a oil uh, drilling derrick or platform and they're you know, putting pipes down, they're wrapping chains around the pipe, that's what they're doing is they're installing this, this drill pipe. So the drill pipe is, you know, is what lets them operate. And that thing turns around and, and drives these giant uh, oil bits uh, or drilling bits uh, through the, the sediments and the rocks and down towards these um, oil reservoirs. Well, when the, um, uh, when the accident happened, so um, they, they drill down, they find this, uh, this uh, reservoir. It's, it's really very good oil, you know, exactly the kind of oil that they want to find. It does seem like there's, you know, they've discovered a 2 billion barrel field. Um, they announced this, their stock prices went, went way up. And um, um, then, you know, so they decided to plug the, the, uh, the, at the end of the well. Well, that didn't work. Um, they, the, the, 
they lost control of the well, which means that the oil and gas were coming, shooting up out of this thing. And um, the last, you know, the last uh, fail safe was supposed to be this blow up preventer. But what happened was that uh, one of the joints in the, in the um, uh, drill pipe happened to lodge itself right in this cutoff valve, the, the, sh the blind shear ram, which is supposed to be able to cut through the, the drill pipe and completely seal the well. So it wasn't able to completely close and it turned out that the batteries were not fully operative. Um, so they cut a lot of corners and they cut these corners for financial reasons. And you know the consequences were extraordinary. Um, I think that the total cost to the BP company of the, 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 the spill and all the judgments against it and the cleanup costs and everything were in excess of $50 billion. Um, so they, they took a, a big chance to try to make a profit and it ended up costing them pretty severely. Um, so once the oil started flowing, uh, it came to the surface. So it had to flow through uh, 1500 meters of, of water. Um, a lot of the oil came to the surface, but a great deal of the oil didn't quite make it all the way up. So the oil was sort of um, broken into pieces. Let's see, this is the, the picture here. You can see the, the, um, the oil gushing out. Well, the process of gushing out sort of atomized the oil. So it broke the oil up into little tiny droplets. Um, by tiny, I mean on the order of uh, you know, 100 micron, 50 micron, so tiny little beads of oil. And these uh, droplets of oil end up getting suspended in the water. They're like, you can think of them as like, you know, water droplets in a cloud. So even though they're buoyant, they couldn't float all the way to the surface. So there was a, a plume of oil in the, uh, in the deep water plume. But then uh, about 25 to 30% of this oil um, got to the surface and uh, formed a surface slick. What I'm going to show you here is a, a movie or a, a animation of the surface oil. And this was put together by my lab, and including my graduate students and myself. And this is made up of uh, the data that we collected from 170 odd uh, satellite images of the oil. And so we took these satellite images and we um, uh, evaluated the oil, sort of analyzed the satellite image to detect where the oil was, and also where there was thick oil and thin oil. And so each of these little pixels here is a five by five kilometer um, square. And in each of the squares, you can see a color coding of the volume of oil in cubic meters per square kilometer. And, um, um, and then the, the other information that you can see in this are these little green streaks that appear on the surface. These are um, the, the paths that they flew with the airplanes that were dispensing dispersants. So they flew over the, 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 the uh, oil spill, the oil slick, and then sprayed um, dispersant, which is kind of a very, uh, very intense uh, detergent out of these airplanes. And um, you know, that was intended to break up the oil and allow it to, to, to disperse. They also conducted burning operations. And so these little dots that you see are where they went out and then they, um, they would tow behind ships. They would tow um, sort of booms and they would collect oil in these booms and light it on fire and burn it. Now this was uh, actually probably one of the more effective things that they did to remove the oil. The dispersants don't appear to have had much of an effect. So anyway, that's the that's the oil spill, and there's a lot more that can be could be said about that. But um, uh, it caused a huge amount of damage, um, you know, both in terms of oil going ashore. It also uh, damaged um, uh, you know fish. It killed, you know, in particular, the fact that the oil spread out over a larger area, and that the spread was was actually helped by the dispersant that was applied, meant that the um, you know although the amount of oil uh, the concentration of oil was reduced, the area over which that oil was distributed actually increased as a result of the dispersant application. And one of the things that has been discovered in the, in the course of the research that was done on the impacts of the oil is that um, in very low concentrations, like parts per billion concentrations, um, oil is uh, very toxic and, and lethal for larval fish and for plankton. 
And so the, you know, the major impact of this spill was in the, the base of the food chain, the zooplankton and the fish larvae. And um, so that was, you know, that was the, the, you know, a lot of the impact there. The other impact was for organisms that have to live at or near the surface. So um, that includes uh, sea turtles, whales, uh, seabirds, um, surface fish. And so they were impacted. Um, uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico had a resident population of sperm whales. This is the, the huge whale, the huge toothed whale, the Moby Dick um, species of whale. So there was a population of about uh, 1,500 sperm whales that were resident in the um, in the, the Gulf of Mexico. And these sperm whales in particular like to hang out right in this area here because um, that's a, a rich area for a, a fish and squid that the sperm whales um, uh, capture and eat. Well, the population of sperm whales uh, was 1,500 approximately before the oil the spill happened. And it is presently about 700 to 800 individuals. So it's been uh, radically reduced. Um, by this uh, by this event, and or we can't totally prove that that happened because uh, no dead sperm whales uh, really ever were recovered. Um, but that's the supposition, and uh, it's also noteworthy that before the uh, oil spill happened, uh, uh, marine mammalogists studying this population were concerned that the that the size of the population 1500 individuals was um, so small that it you know that it was not necessarily sustainable that it was at risk um, to some event that would you know that would start um, reducing the, the population and um, so having cut it in half you know raises a concern about you know whether or not sperm whales will continue to survive in the Gulf in the, in the long term. So that's just one of many, many, many impacts. And I'm sure you've had a chance to read and appreciate that. But uh, let me move on and talk about a few other topics. And um, you know, so we've been talking about fossil fuel. And I just wanted to give some numbers here. And one of the important numbers, uh, we we're concerned about fossil fuels and, and that you know, they're a threat to the stability of the planet and to climate change because of the emission of CO2. And CO2 enters into the atmosphere, it uh, promotes the greenhouse effect. And so the amount of CO2 which is released according to different fuels is very important. So we started out talking about coal uh, and I talked about the different style and forms of coal, anthracite is the, um, is the uh, metallurgic coal, bitumous is the brown coal. Um, so these are these coals. And as you, as you go down in grade, um, you reduce the amount of CO2 uh, that's, that's emitted. And these, uh, this particular graph shows pounds of C2, BTU, per, uh, pounds of CO2 per million British thermal units. So it's not a, not a, a metric uh, um, evaluation, but these are all the same numbers. So you can see relatively that um, uh, coal releases almost uh, twice as much CO2 as does natural gas and propane. Um, and you know, uh, diesel fuel, gasoline are also um, you know much more uh, emitting. They also emit uh, a lot of um, CO2. So the, you know, the, the take home message here is that if we can transition from using uh, coal to using natural gas as a fuel source, then we can reduce the, the amount of, uh, of uh, CO2 that's emitted in the, into the atmosphere and hopefully reduce the, the, the climate impacts. And um, so that's, the, that's the, the idea behind this. And that's why it's been so, uh, so much promoted that, that uh, natural gas should be a replacement. And, and indeed, uh, natural gas has increasingly replaced um, CO2. Uh, oh, another um, number here, maybe I should have showed this first, is to say that um, the United States is the country which produces the most oil. And so we've heard that, but, you know, we think that Saudi Arabia has all the oil, but in fact, you know, we're producing nearly uh, 15 billion barrels of oil. Yeah, 15 billion barrels of oil um, um, per day. Uh, it's sort of a shocking number. Um, um, 
this is a yearly oil per barrels per day. That doesn't make sense. I think this is the yearly number. Uh, so 15 billion uh, opposed to like uh, 12 billion from uh, Saudi Arabia, 11 billion from Russia. China has a very low number. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the United States is a leading producer or the leading producer of crude oil, but we're also a leading producer of uh, natural gas, and that's um, largely owing to the growth of the fracking industry. So um, natural gas production by region, uh, North America, you can see, is a pretty sizable uh, player in this and probably the leading producer of natural gas, uh, if you look at the different uh, numbers here on the chart. So we're producing in billions of cubic meters, uh, you know, a thousand billion cubic meters, so trillions of cubic meters um, uh, per year. This is, the, this is the annual production. So in 2019, uh, we were a, a big leader in that. And that number has has gone up you know it used to be fairly constant and then it started really ramping up in in uh, 2010 as the fracking industry really got got started so um it's it's worth noting that uh obama gets a uh, gets a lot of criticism for you know having tried you know uh, not promoted energy and stood in the way of energy progress but you know throughout his administration and of course continuing on in the present administration um the uh, the, the prevalence of fracking and the the amount of gas produced by fracking has increased steadily um, you know, some other, you know, as we transition away from carbon, and that's what we really need to do, um, the, the, the energy sector, which is going to lead that, is going to be uh, renewables. And so, um, you know, the renewables are in green. Uh, well, these are the different, um, uh, you know, so the sh uh, shares of primary energy and renewables. Um, and so renewables will go up and hydrocarbons will go down. And there are a couple of different scenarios. So the business as usual scenario predicts that we just continue with um, you know, the same sort of trends that we have presently. And uh, the rapid transition envisions a, um, a sort of a mixed uh, approach where we're using both hydrocarbons and um, and uh, renewable energy, solar and wind energy. Uh, and then the net zero, um, which sort of, uh, you know, tries to achieve this net zero by 2050 um, a number, you know, which a, a couple of countries have now sort of committed to just recently, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, both committed to be uh, carbon, uh, to be, you know, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The United States, of course, has is, is, is made no such promise. So this is gaining strength. And, you know, this is the way that that transition is going to occur. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about fracking. So uh, fracking is short for hydraulic fracturing. And the basic principle of hydraulic fracturing is that um, you're drilling into beds of coal or shale um, formations, uh, particularly coal, and um, that there is gas trapped in these seams of coal or in these uh, beds of shale. Um, so you often hear about shale gas or coal gas. And so this is, these are natural gas. This is uh, uh, methane, propane uh, that's trapped in these layers. And the idea is that you drill down, um, um, you know, in, you drill down, you know, uh, thousands of feet down into these, into these shale layers. And the, initially the, the, the fracking well drills down straight down and then it, uses what's called horizontal drilling technology. So the drill bit then is steered uh, when you get to the target depth and the drill bit then goes off into these seams. And you know, you'll recall that when I presented the, uh, uh, the uh, slide about how the traditional uh, shaft and um, uh, seam uh, coal mine um, uh, worked well. The same idea is, is, you know, where there would be a shaft drilled down, and then uh, individual seams of coal would be attacked by uh, tunnels that branched off from this main shaft. Well, the same sort of uh, you know geometry obtains here uh, with uh, with fracking. So they drill down, and then they uh, pump uh, water and sand and chemicals, some mix of chemicals, uh, down into the into the uh, 
into this into this well, and then they uh, hit it with waves of pressure. Um, and so, you know, there are huge uh, sort of pumps and, and air gun like uh, compressive devices that send shock waves uh, through this uh, called liquid column, and that causes the um, the the uh, layers that the, that the well is, is penetrated to fracture. And with that fracture, um, the gas that's trapped in the, in, the, in the layers of rock is released and then can be collected back through this well or associated wells. So that's the basic idea of fracking. Um, and you know, if you look at uh, fracking energy uh, industry um, information, they'll point out that this is particularly safe. So there's some you know, concerns about uh, fracking. And among the concerns are the fracking chemicals, um, and the, the uh, integrity and safety of uh, drinking water, particularly drinking water that's obtained from groundwater sources or from aquifers. And um, then the chemicals which are used in this fracking fluid. And so there's a number of problems with this. The, the chemicals that are, that are used in this fracking fluid, um, the, the industry is not required by law to disclose what those chemicals are. And so um, you know, one doesn't know, the, the public is not aware, cannot find out you know, what is being used to be pumped into the ground and then potentially returned. Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is that these fluids don't just stay down there, they have to be uh, removed. And uh, you know, when the oil, when the gas is produced from these wells, uh, with it comes a lot of this, this fluid. So what to do with this fluid? Um, and there's also potential uh, uh, contamination. Now the, the fracking industry will say that, the, that the, the layers, the shale layers that are fractured are typically thousands of feet below the level of the groundwater or the aquifers. And that's, there's certainly a lot of truth to that. However, um, if you're trying to break up the ground and liberate and cause migration of, of, of gas and, and liquids, um, you, know, you have to be aware that there's a possibility that some of this contamination will occur. Um, to date, there's, I don't know of any you know, studies showing widespread contamination of aquifers uh, from fracking. Usually the contamination occurs as a result not of the release of, of fluids in these wells, but in the, in the um, uh, impacts that they have uh, when the, the produced fluid is taken out. So let me uh, change um, screens here and we'll look at a different screen here. This is, let's see. All right, so I'm looking at um, uh, a blog post by the uh, environmental organization SkyTruth. I think I might have talked about SkyTruth on Tuesday. Uh, SkyTruth is a nonprofit um, a public interest organization, and they use publicly available satellite data and aerial data to look for uh, environmental impacts. And they've done a lot of work on fracking. And um, so this is a series that they have visualizing expansion of fracking in Pennsylvania. And I think what's notable about this is they look at all of the different ranges of impact uh, about fracking. And so they start with this site here. So this is you know, using satellite data and then showing what happens um, when fracking occurs. So you, know, you had the initial area and then subsequently uh, several frack zones or frack um, um, installations were installed. And so right away, there's an impact on the environment as, as um, roads are built and streams are, are, are uh, 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 forests are cleared to install these facilities. Dr. McDonald, are you meaning to share your screen right now? I am, am I not shared? No, sir. Oh dear. Really? I'm seeing you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, all right, so let me go back. 
So this is showing um, it's tracking, you know, what happens using satellite data to track what happens when uh, fracking is expanded. And the, the example here is a, is a, a county in um, uh, Pennsylvania. So the first thing that happens is that the forests are cleared and um, roads are built and then these facilities are installed. And these are all sort of, uh, 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 you know, pads like this. And then the, these individuals, the, so, you know, initially there would be a drill stem and rigs and so forth. But once that drilling is finished, then the fracking facility looks looks like this, this, this sort of pad here. And this pool right here is one of the places where the frac fluid is installed. And I know generally speaking, you can see that there are you know, widespread changes that occur you know, when these, uh, when these uh, fracking facilities are put in place. So let's go look at the second stage here. Is it similar to like cell towers where they pay people who own the land to allow them to, to set up a fracking site? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, exactly. It's exactly like that. Now uh, people are paid to, to you know, to, to, um, uh, to be allowed to frack their land. Uh, although sometimes depending, you know, sometimes there's certain kinds of mineral rights where, um, you know, fracking and pipelines can be installed and the, the property owners, you know, may not have control over the mineral rights for the, um, the, the uh, minerals that are the resources that are located under their land. And so a lot that has to do with that. And so this is again looking at these changes, and you can see that there's been a major transformation of the landscape, you know, as this fracking, um, you know, expands. And so the the impacts are, you know, very much uh, distributed and take the form of um, you know changes to the landscape, and then also uh, impoundment centers where the, the fracking fluids are stalled. And you know the, the problem with that is that they can be so there. You know, right here is a is an impoundment area where uh, the flat frac fluid is 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 uh, kept. Um, after it's pumped out of the ground, a lot of it does get reinjected, um, but there's still storage on on um, on land in, and on the surface. And if there's floods, uh, which occur fairly frequently, this fracking material can then enter into the watershed um, through that route. Okay, so um, you know this is uh, you know uh, sort of more material on this, and I, you know you can pursue this uh, if you look this up. But you can see that in some cases there have been you know pretty severe, pretty you know severe um, alterations as a result of this. So there's you know wide widespread transformation, um, you know, because of the fracking industry. And so um, you know, this uh, transition that we've had and this uh, boom that we've enjoyed in terms of cheaper electricity and more widespread natural gas has come with this environmental cost. All right, I'm going to move on from fracking. Well, one last uh, idea about fracking. Let's see. Oh. Stop sharing. And talk about Florida. So in Florida, they're trying to frack, and um, this is a little video that I made, sort of anti-fracking propaganda, but I think that fracking in Florida is a really bad idea, even worse than, um, because uh, Florida, the geology of Florida is such that we have a limestone foundation, so our undersetting is um, uh, rock which can dissolve with these corrosive chemicals, and so if we think about, you know, the hazards of um, sinkholes, which are you know, pretty common in uh, Florida as a, as a result of natural processes, um, we can also get these uh, sorts of events. So we could potentially 
uh, exacerbate the formation of sinkholes as a result of fracking. Um, so the idea that this is all going to happen below ground and have no impact in the, in the surface is something that we really need to think about and question. All right, just a few more, um, uh, one more topic here before I turn this over to Carrie, and that is uh, talking about uh, different types of um, sort of environmental action and uh, you know public protest that's occurred as a result of um, the conflict between environmental concerns and the fossil fuel industry. And I wanted to talk about the Keystone Pipeline that's been a lot in the news. So the Keystone Pipeline uh, is a series, actually a series of pipelines um, that are designed to transport um, a certain kind of oil from uh, where it's produced in Alberta down into the um, Midwest and then ultimately to Texas. And this uh, Keystone Pipeline uh, uh, project was completed in a number of different sections. Some of them completed, some of them haven't been completed. Well, um, you know, the, the pipeline itself is designed to produce uh, oil that's, that comes out of what's called oil sands or tar sands. And these are geologic formations where there are hydrocarbons. Remember I talked about uh, how oil can is produced in the oil production window and that uh, if the uh, you know, if the burial is deeper than a certain level and the temperature is higher, then the oil starts getting cooked, um, you know, so it's no longer liquid. Well, um, the uh, west of Canada, and actually there's a lot of tar sands in the, in the western United States, um, these are formations in which exactly that process has occurred geologically. So there was a, you know, in geologic past, there was an oil reservoir, and then the burial and heating of that oil reservoir um, sort of overcooked the, 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 um, the oil that was there, leaving behind this sort of tarry uh, residue. Well, um, there are vast uh, stores of this of this uh, this form of hydrocarbon, and they're heavily produced in uh, Canada. So Canada has a reputation as being sort of progressive and so forth, but they actually have a very um, polluting and uh, environmentally impactful uh, energy sector. And uh, so, what do you do with this this uh, tar sand? So the this particular, what's produced is sort of this heavy, you know, almost solid um, uh, material, and it has to be heated and mixed with solvents to get it to flow. And so um, that's what the, the Keystone Pipeline is, is designed to do. So they take this, um, this gas, this tar, and they heat it up in order to, in order to make it um, um, transportable. They have to heat it, and they heat it by burning copious amounts of, of natural gas. Um, so the production of the, uh, the tar before they even burn it itself uh, produces a tremendous amount of greenhouse gas. Well, then they want to put it into this pipeline uh, and ship it down to processing plants in uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and then on eventually to uh, Houston, Texas. Um, so uh, the uh, you know, this is, uh, I was talking about the break-even costs for different kinds of, of, of fuels. Well, the, the break-even cost for, and this is several years ago, so it may be higher now, the break-even cost for um, uh, oil from tar sands was $70 a barrel. Well, oil hasn't been at $70 a barrel for a long time. So there's a quite a bit of a puzzle as to how this, uh, this uh, pipeline uh, could ever be economic. Um, nonetheless, uh, they spent a huge um, amount of money uh, putting it together. So between 19, I, I read some, I read in Wikipedia that between uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2018 and 2019, um, the cost of the XL pipeline project was $1.5 billion. So there's a huge capital investment here. Well, there's also been concerns about, you know, what the impact of this would be. And these concerns have, you know, um, you know particularly reached uh, uh, ahead in protests in the Dakotas uh, by in, uh, Native American peoples of the Sioux tribe, uh, the Red River Sioux in particular. 
And they were concerned about the, the fact that this pipeline crosses their uh, river at a number of places. And the idea is that if, they, if there was a breach in the uh, pipeline, then there would be an oil spell into their um, uh, water supply. And there's also concern in the, culturally uh, about the, um, uh, the impact of this uh, development on native lands and, and uh, culturally important uh, uh, components of their reservation. So there have been at various times very, very uh, heated confrontations between the authorities, uh, the pipeline builders, the government, etc. cetera. Um, and where this stands currently is that uh, in April of uh, 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 this year, April of uh, 2020, the uh, Native American Routes Foundation uh, appeared before the uh, uh, United States District Court of Montana for oral arguments in the uh, Rosebud Sioux Tribe versus um, Trump. And um, so that was a, you know, until that ruling comes down, the pipeline has essentially been stopped. And so the ruling is still, is still pending. So um, after spending all that money and you know, all of that uh, labor, it's not clear at all if this thing is ever going to be completed or that you know, if it is completed, that it would ever be profitable or even economically feasible. And so you know, once again, we see that uh, finances and uh, uh, you know, public impacts you know, have a huge uh, effect on the way in which uh, fossil fuels are produced and the way in which we get our energy. Okay, that's as much as I had, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Any questions over the material that I've covered? No? Okay, in that case, um, Carrie, are you around? to share your screen, yeah. I think there you are, okay. All right, well, I'm gonna stop my, and do you have permission to share or do I have to offer that? Can you share your um, screen? No, I can share. Okay, all right, well, I, so Carrie O'Reilly is uh, my graduate student and as well as my teaching assistant in this class. And uh, she is, uh, uh, did her master's thesis work on the, an oil spill that is uh, called the um, Taylor Energy oil spill. And so I'll let her describe that to you uh, because it's a sort of a case study of how, uh, you know, the kind of some of the risks uh, posed by the offshore energy industry. Okay, Carrie, go ahead and take it away. So you have to choose your, there you go. Yeah, it was, it was just it. Wait, so now are you seeing this video? I see the screen, I don't see a video. I see the- Okay, yeah, I just moved our um, Zoom thing out of the way. Okay, um, so like Dr. McDonald said, I've been working on the Taylor Energy oil spill for the last couple of years, and I just adapted this PowerPoint from my thesis. Um, to focus on our cruise back in 2018. So thousands of small spills um, of less than a barrel of oil or 42 gallons are occurring in US waters each year. But since the Santa Barbara spill back in 1969 that I think was mentioned uh, on Tuesday, there have been 44 spills releasing over 100,000 barrels each. So we want to focus on the Taylor Energy spill. Um, the Taylor Energy platform was located in Leaf Block MC20, which is approximately 16 kilometers southeast of the South Pass of the Mississippi River. It was an eight pile platform with 28 wells constructed at a depth of 145 meters and was built in 1984. Um, between 2000 and 2004, four wells were producing gas and 13 were producing oil for um, a daily production of 1,200 barrels per day. On September 16th, 2004, Hurricane Ivan, which was a Category 4 storm, crossed the Gulf of Mexico 
and triggered an underwater mudslide that toppled the Taylor Energy platform. It dragged the jacket 200 meters southeast of its original location and um, bending and burying the conductor bundle under 20 meters of deposited sediments at the northwest corner of the jacket. Um, this image is showing what it looked like before the hurricane and then afterwards the, that conductor bundle bent and dragged over here. And persistent surface slicks of oil have been observed over the last 16 years since the hurricane. So in response to this, um, Taylor Energy Unified Command was formed in 2007 um, because it became apparent that federal assistance was necessary to attempt to stop the spill. The Unified Command consists of uh, the Coast Guard as the federal on-scene coordinator and Taylor Energy as a responsible party with federal agencies like Bessie and NOAA serving in advisory roles. The, uh, not long after the hurricane, the initial response actions were plugging and abandoning nine wells, dredging and removing some large debris, including a platform deck. And they did try to um, install containment domes, which ended up failing in 2013. And at this point, Taylor Energy claimed that further response efforts had a higher risk of harming the environment than leaving the remaining debris as is due to the complicated site conditions, which resulted in prolonged disagreements over how to handle those response efforts. So the main point of this slide is just that they, um, Taylor had to enter into a trust agreement with the Department of Interior, um, basically just committing to funding all activities to decommission the site. And they placed $660 million into that trust account and they would pay for decommissioning activities out of pocket. And then this trust fund would reimburse them. Um, this trust agreement doesn't require that the obligations are performed in a set period of time. So it will terminate whenever the government and Taylor agree that all the obligations have been fulfilled. So Taylor requested that the government acknowledge that no further decommissioning work could be completed. Uh, and this request was denied under the assumption that future advances in technology would allow Taylor to complete the remaining obligations. So at this point, uh, $432 million of Taylor's money is frozen in this trust account. And they filed a lawsuit stating that the Department of Interior was in breach of contract and began conducting additional research at the site to provide uh, more evidence as to why they think they should get that money back. This led to Taylor developing the rum punch hypothesis that the surface slicks that we're seeing are a result of remnant oil being released from the sediments. The rum punch analogy basically states that as a bowl of punch is repeatedly spiked with rum, the composition of the mixture will have an increasingly larger rum content. So as a leaking well provides a continuous input of hydrocarbons, the composition of the slick will trend towards the leaking well's hydrocarbon composition. And based on analyzing surface samples Taylor had collected, they say that this is not true. No one else really accepted this hypothesis due to the lack of subsurface sampling efforts. So Bessie requested that NOAA organize a cruise to perform surveys to quantify the source characteristics and flux of the plumes present at the site. So during the first week of September in 2018, we went out to the site on the Brooks McCall, which was the ship on my title slide. And this image is just showing the location of the Taylor Energy site with Deepwater Horizon for reference. The site has three erosional pits, two created during response efforts and one created by the emission of oil and gas right here. And this image is showing how the conductor bundle leads from the original location of the platform to the northwest corner of the jacket, which is the source of those slicks. Both surface and subsurface acoustic surveys were performed to characterize the spatial structure of the plumes and locate the seafloor origin of the slicks. The surface surveys were conducted using this uh, overboard pole attached to the side of the ship that had all these sensors on it to um, track the slick. 
And then this is an example of the ship track uh, while we were tracking the plume's location. Subsurface surveys were conducted following the surface surveys to examine the plume in the water column. Um, separate echo sounders were integrated onto our ROV. And when the main plume was detected, uh, the ROV would be deployed to collect more acoustic data, data within the water column. Dr. McDonald had designed an oil and gas bubble collecting an imaging device, which we call the bubbleometer, that was attached to the lower platform of the ROV and was used to characterize the plumes um, within the water column. So its components include the visualization chamber, transparent collection tube, and four pressure sealed sample cylinders. The visualization chamber is a three-sided square with a white background and it's open on the bottom and the side facing the camera, which is here, with an inverted funnel mounted on top, which feeds the oil and gas from the chamber up into the collection tube. The bubbleometer was used to collect videos of the plume as well as water column samples of oil, gas, and water. Collection of the physical samples was initiated by closing the valve at the top of the collection tube and a hydraulic arm on the ROV extended the bubbleometer out into the plume, allowing the bubbles to travel up through the chamber and into the collection tube. And once we had a sample in the collection tube, the bubbleometer was retracted to close off further collection. And then a manual valve or a remotely triggered system was activated to pull the sample into one of those for surface evacuated cylinders. And once we were at the surface, the cylinders were disconnected from the bubbleometer. Um, gas portions were collected first by using a bleeder valve to control the release of the gas into foil sample bags. And then we removed the bottom threaded plug of the cylinder to drain any oil and water into sample jars. The last of the physical samples that were collected were sediment samples using a box core um, to analyze oil content. Samples were collected at one kilometer intervals beginning at a reference site three kilometers away from that northwest corner erosional pit and ending one kilometer from that corner. At that point, samples were collected at 100 uh, meter intervals with the last sample taken right at the perimeter of the pit. Samples were taken from the top five centimeters of the box score at each location. And um, you can see that the samples are getting darker as we got closer to the pit. Atmospheric methane measurements were also there taken. Was that, uh, last, was that a frogfish in that last picture? Yeah, I think so. Yes, that's a frogfish, Gogocephalus. <laughs> He's, uh, we got him right in the, you know, he was right in the oily area there. And he's a fish that has to live on the bottom. So, um, yeah, you wrong place, wrong time for him. <laughs> but for the uh, atmospheric methane measurements, intake tubing was placed towards the bow of the ship to avoid any influence from engine exhaust. And it was run into the dry lab where a cavity ring down spectrometer was located. These samples were collected 24 hours a day. In order to determine if the observed atmospheric methane was a result of the plumes reaching the surface, a tracer experiment was conducted to track the dispersion of methane in the vicinity of the slick. So a raft was built to hold um, the tracer gas Right in there. Um, the raft was deployed and anchored within the slick, and then the ship drifted downwind to increase the likelihood of detecting both the atmospheric methane and our tracer gas. And then afterwards, an inverse plume modeling approach was used to trace that dispersed methane back to the source of emission. So once we got back to campus, um, my job was to process all those bubbleometer videos to prepare them for use in MATLAB. Um, so these were still images I pulled from videos and then 
I had to edit them a little bit. I had to rotate them because the camera rotated while it was underwater and then cropped them. So only the visualization chamber remained. We used a um, machine learning algorithm in MATLAB to count, classify, and measure the gas and oil bubbles in these still images. Bubbles that were predominantly gas um, were in there and they had a layer of oil. Um, so they're transparent with the dark band along the bottom. We had oily gas bubbles that were transparent with the yellow tinge and bubbles that were predominantly oil uh, that were different shades of brown. And these are just examples of those bubble types outlined. Um, gas is red and oil is yellow. The machine learning algorithm was a faster regional convolutional neural network um, because that specializes in classifying sections of pixels into predetermined classes. So we assigned bubbles to one of two classes, either gas bubbles with a fraction of oil or oil bubbles assumed to be predominantly oil. And then we had to train the network um, by generating a ground truth set of images where we manually classify bubbles. And then these images are showing total number of bubbles detected and those classified in each category while we were training that algorithm. Our detector was then tested on the remaining. Um, so we used 70% in the testing and then 30% of the ground truth images were um, tested. Just examples of different outputs while we were testing and, and training everything. Mm -hmm. So we had to scale and normalize our data since, and since we had noticed that the gas bubbles had pools of oil in the lower portion, I measured 100 random bubbles in ImageJ and found that on average gas bubbles contain 36% uh, oil per volume. And we also normalized um, the gas volumes to a depth of 140 meters, which was the deepest any bubbles had been recorded to create a constant environment. And we also assumed that there were three depth domains based on the physical constraints on the plume. There was the crater, which was within the erosional pit, the benthic layer, which was above the pit to the top of the jacket, and midwater, which was above the jacket. And we also estimated oil flux, and that was quantified through both visual and acoustic methods. For the visual method, um, GIS and flater mouse were used to define cross-sectional areas of the plumes for bubbles within each depth domain. Cross-sections defined oil and gas bubbles as discrete population samples within each depth domain. And then Stokes law was used to determine separate flux estimates for each bubble type. And for the acoustic method, regions were exported from acoustic echograms that define backscatter intensity and also cross-sectional areas. Since oil and gas are rising at two different speeds, we had to use two estimates uh, to determine the fastest rate that gas rises and the slowest rate that oil rises. So the results of all of these surveys, um, the surface acoustic surveys differentiated between plume components rising at different rates. The gas bubbles were rising faster and separated out from these slower rising oil bubbles. Um, the subsurface surveys revealed that the main plume within the erosional pit could actually be divided into five different subcomponents. There were two smaller plumes comprised mostly of oil, two larger plumes comprised mostly of gas, and then a less defined fifth feature. So the computer vision algorithm detected a total of 12,139 bubbles from 665 images. And that generated spreadsheets that organized data by image and by bubble with things like the number of bubbles, area, radius, um, area and volume of equivalent spheres and ellipses. And from this, we saw that there is a linear relationship between the total bubble volume and proportion of oil. So all the gas bubble volumes were calculated using that 36% oil proportion 
at a 140 meter constant pressure that I mentioned earlier. Estimated spherical volumes of bubbles were used to calculate the rise velocity. Diameter measurements showed that frequency distribution is skewed towards smaller sizes of approximately five millimeters, but about 80% of the volume transport comes from bubbles of larger diameters. The ellipsoidal volumes of bubbles were used to calculate plume concentrations. And um, like I said, the concentrations of oil and gas were partitioned by five meter depth intervals in each image with the corresponding domain shown on the right of each graph. And this was graphed for both oil versus gas bubbles and oil versus the oil portion of gas bubbles, showing distinct characteristics for each depth domain. And the main points of the gas sample analyses are that um, they suggest that the source is primarily thermogenic and not produced by microbial activity, which is what Taylor Energy has been claiming. So you can see that samples were composed of entirely thermogenic gas with deep water horizon for reference with our samples right here, and then uh, biogenic samples shown up here. Through the chemical analyses of the oil, water, and sediments, it was found that they closely resemble the signature of a historic well sample. Um, they exhibit the same pattern of degradation. Comparisons were also made among alkanes and subsurface oils, subsurface water, and surface water. Some degradation is occurring between the midwater and surface due to loss of alkanes in the C9 to C14 range from evaporation. And some degradation could also be occurring as oil passes through the last one to two meters of sediment. But um, our oil is most likely degraded because the well, well is degraded. We also looked at percent total weight of pHs among the sediment, water, and oil. This figure is showing that pHs found in the water are consistent with particulate oil. Midwater samples contain pHs that are absent from surface water samples, possibly due to that evaporation, but midwater samples do closely resemble oil samples. And this highlights that an entire segment of pHs are present in the water column that are absent from the sediments, which is further evidence that the sediments are not the source of the oil, as Taylor claims. For atmospheric methane, approximately 1.5 million CRDS readings were collected. Any methane concentration above the background of 1.85 parts per million was considered an addition of atmospheric methane by an external factor. Um, and you can see here that the highest concentration of 11.74 parts per million was recorded directly over the bubbles and the jacket as indicated by this heat map. During the tracer raft deployment, the CRDS detected three spikes in our tracer gas. Again, the highest of which was directly over our erosional pit where the slicks are coming from. Imaging obtained from the ROV indicated that there were um, two main plumes originating in that pit that remained distinct throughout our vertical range of sampling. And this figure is showing bubble samples as white dots and the plume cross sections within each depth domain. Cross sections were used to calculate oil volumes and fluxes by analyzing bubbles within the core of each depth domain for each bubble type and bubbles outside of those cores weren't analyzed. So Stokes law was used to calculate separate fluxes for each bubble type in each domain, ranging from 17 to 107 barrels per day, based on our visual estimates. And then with the acoustic estimates, those on um, that flux range from nine to 47 barrels per day. So as a reminder um, of what I said earlier, the rum punch hypothesis states that there are two possible scenarios that could explain site conditions. Um, the surface sheen is being produced by remnant oil in the sediments and not by an active well leak, or there is an active well leak, but the discharge from the well is less, less than the discharge from the sediments. This hypothesis relies on an incomplete data set because it didn't consider oil and gas within the water column, but they consistently argued 
that scenario one is the most likely explanation. However, the results that I was presented um, contributed to refuting this hypothesis. Um, so what helped uh, support our cruise data is this containment system. So throughout this entire situation, the Taylor Energy Unified Command has um, not agreed on how to move forward. Um, containment is the only feasible option at this time. And the Coast Guard eventually had to issue a notice of federal assumption to assume control over these response actions and chose the Kuvion group to install a containment system. So last year, this containment system was installed um, and ended up collecting approximately 7,600 barrels of oil between April 2019 and February 2020 for, for approximately 26 barrels per day, which corroborates both our bubbleometer and acoustic flux estimates. So as um, the longest lasting oil spill in US history, part of my thesis was talking about policy, so it should result in modifications to existing law. Um, the study developed novel flux methodologies, which helped guide response, accelerated containment efforts, and can be implemented on a larger scale to provide quick, accurate flux estimates in the immediate aftermath of a spill. This data collection and analysis led to refuting Taylor Energy's long-held stance that a well was not actively leaking and environmental damages are minimal. And this will hopefully lead to some preliminary natural resource damage studies. And that's all I will talk about today since we are running out of time, I think. Okay, well, thank you, Carrie. Uh, any questions? No questions? Did that, did this, um, did your, like, did all of your research um, have, have an effect on, on Taylor, on, on their, on the company? Um, not really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they can't um, go back and drill any more intervention wells to actually stop the leak. So all we can do is contain it. Um, so the containment did support all of our research. So we think we're right on that front, but as of now, they can't really do anything else about it. Yeah, well, I, I, I would also add to that, that, you know, the Taylor Energy Company is sort of a, you know, I mean, it's been kind of a bad actor, I think we have to say, you know, it's, it, it hasn't really taken responsibility and it's tried to walk away to, you know, to, you know, save, you know, to get that money back, that $400 million. Um, you know, what the impact of, of, you know, Carrie's work and the work we all did together was to convince the Coast Guard and the EPA that there was a big problem here. And because they, you know, the reason that we did this cruise in the first place is because they were uncertain about whether or not there was actually oil coming out. And you know when we actually landed the ROV and saw those huge plumes of, 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 of oil and gas that Carrie showed you in the in the video from the bubbleometer, it was like that was enough. And when as soon as the Coast Guard saw that, before we had even done any analysis or before Carrie had finished her thesis, they had turned around and contracted with Cuvion. So the reason that the Coast Guard went to the containment system and, and went outside the unified command was because of the results that we obtained um, you know, with this crew. So I think we did have an impact um, on you know, the way in which the, the, the crisis is being uh, managed. Okay, yeah, that's, that, that was what I meant. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was hoping that, yeah, after you guys did this, um, at the results did show that and uh, and they're and they're not able to just. Uh, well, they've been uh, ordered. The government has ordered has come back and ordered them to. So, if you remember the timeline that Kerry showed, you know, back in 2013, I guess it was. The government said, "Okay, well, we think the problem is finished," and um, 
you know, we think that, you know, that's, they, the, the government basically bought Taylor's argument that there wasn't a, a significant oil spill going on. And they were, you know, Taylor had estimated that there was like 10 gallons a day coming out of this well. And, you know, back in before this project happened, I had done research and my other students had done research and we were finding satellite pictures that showed, you know, oil slicks that were 10 miles long. Well, there's no way that you can make a 10 mile long oil slick with 10 gallons of, 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 uh, of oil. Um, just, there's just not enough molecules in that much oil uh, to make that big a layer. Um, so, you know, we thought that there was uh, evidence that there was an ongoing oil spill and, and there were environmental, uh, in fact, I was part of a lawsuit with the um, uh, Apalachicola River Keepers. I don't know if you've heard of that organization, but they're a local, well, the River Keepers are a national organization and the Apalachicola River Keepers is the local branch of that. So they sued the uh, tailor um, to release their, the data that they had been collecting. And as a result of that, we learned more about this whole process. Uh, and so that a lot of the data that we showed or that Kerry showed from the, from the, uh, the, the files was released as a result of the lawsuit that this environmental organization uh, uh, argued. And so one of the settlements was that they had to release that data. So, you know, science and uh, public action and government action can, can work. Um, and it's important, you know, that we don't lose track of that, you know, that possibility that, you know, all these different levels can function together. How does that containment system actually work? I mean, is it, is there, how much can it contain? Why don't you go back and show that slide again, Kerry? So the, the, the domes that they had built before, they were sort of like giant versions of the bubbleometer. They were big sort of domes and they set them on the seabed. Well, what happened was that the, the sediments here are very, very loose and unconsolidated. And so, uh, and there's constant oil and gas coming up through. And so the, the, the domes just sank down into the, into the mud and stopped working. Well, the, the containment system that, that, uh, that Kuvion built is attached to the fallen legs of the platform. So it's not sitting on the bottom. And it's essentially kind of like a big shelf or awning that sticks out over those uh, release points. And so the oil comes up under there and it's sort of captured and the gas is part of that driver on that. And then the uh, oil and gas uh, separator um, um, uh, you know, collects the oil and then the oil is collected into the storage tanks. So, um, uh, you know, it, it works uh, pretty well and they get, but if there are strong currents, what can happen is the currents can push the, the oil and the gas out from underneath this dome and so that they come to the surface. So even though this is mostly effective and captures probably, you know, 80 or 90% of the oil, you know, if there's strong currents or certain kind of weather conditions, you still can get surface slicks from this site because the oil hasn't stopped flowing. It's just that they're managing to capture more of it than they used to do. And then they, do they go back and collect these storage containers then? Yeah, they go back, they collect the oil and they actually sell that oil. Um, you know, they get 26 barrels a day, which is worth, you know, 26 times 40 bucks. <laughs> so they actually sell that. And I don't know, they don't, that's not, you know, they don't make a lot and of that, money. And that money goes to Kubion or does that, where does that money go? I'm not sure how that works. Uh, I think it goes to Kubion because they're the ones that are doing this whole operation. And if they didn't sell the oil, they'd have to dispose of it. So, you know, uh, selling it is not a bad option because then it just goes to a refinery and gets processed like any other oil. That's pretty neat research. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, well, Carrie did a good job. Well, she's, all she's got to do is write a uh, PhD dissertation. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess we didn't have a session there. So uh, the next big thing on everybody's plate is this uh, milestone three coming up with your. So uh, 
Carrie will be setting up meetings over the next couple of weeks. And we'll be getting together with each individual team and trying to give you some advice and guidance on how to make sure your project comes together. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. I'm sorry, you might have already mentioned this, but when when is the milestone three due for this class? Good question. Milestone three is due. Let me make sure what I put in the thing here. On campus, it sets next next Tuesday the third. Yeah, I'm going to extend that. Um, so I'll give you a week more because of advent, events and everything else. So we'll say that the milestone three is due a week from Tuesday. OK, thank you so much. So um, and, you know, in terms of I'll, I'll put out an announcement to this so there's no confusion. But um, in terms of what I want, I want to see a, we want to see sort of rough drafts. It's understood that, you know, you're not going to have the final product. But you have to have material put together so that um, um, you know we can help you to to improve what you've got, and to also see that you've you know that you've made an effort to you know to get the to do the research, to assemble a presentation, to tell a, a cohesive story. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, see you later. I know. <laughs>